We are still coming off the high of a weird basketball game that ended with a good result for K-State on Monday night. But as always, it's time to shift our focus to football because, look, uh, there was some pretty significant news yesterday. Uh, the big dogs in the uh, recruiting industry, known as On3, uh, our, our parent company, they dropped their 2025 rankings yesterday. And there is a lot of K-State flavor to the high end of what they put out. Four stars galore, even, you know, one really significant K-State target that K-State is firmly in the mix for that got five-star status now. Like, there's a lot going on here. So we bring Drew in to give us all the good info on it and uh, give his thoughts on what some of it means because there's one guy, the only commitment so far of the class of 25, that he got left out of the, the four-star fold right now but based on where he sits and the fact that he has a season to be played, there's a chance that we're looking at Dylan Duff maybe being a four-star when all is said and done. So let's just dive into it, Drew. With everything that came out yesterday, uh, was there a big surprise with where some of these guys fell that K-State's targeting? I, I think that my biggest takeaway is probably where everybody sits because we're used to seeing – K-State targeting players and they have their base rating usually probably honestly similar to where Dylan Duff sits and then senior year comes along and that's when they really get the big bump so I, I was more taken aback and surprised that there's so many players that K-State's in on right now that got that big jump already because it, it, it's more of like a when I do some stuff later on in like June, July, like one of the first things that I usually write about is like who can potentially take that next jump to be a four star. And, and now we're in the, the territory of like, okay, who can take this jump to go from four star to five star with some of these players. So it, it's crazy to think about that. This is the pool that case eight is dipping into it, it. For me, it doesn't change a whole lot because I, I liked the players that they were going after. So for me, it's more validation of like, okay, I, I think that I saw what some of these other sites have seen. So it, it, it feels good when you, you like somebody and somebody's high on your board and they're, then you get the, the stars to match. But like, honestly, though, like the, all the rankings and star stuff is like all arbitrary and like it, it doesn't really matter in the long run, but it, it's nice to talk about. Well, and it does matter in some way because there's a good chunk of it that is really about, uh, you know, like the status of, that goes with it. And it helps you as, yes. you know, as a as a staff and then kind of the buzz that goes with you to be in on these guys. And, and that's where K-State is kind of sitting right now. So I think it does matter in some ways. And also, like, at the end of the day uh, – John Kurtz, the man that loves saying stars matter more than anybody I know, uh, just because, you know, K-State has been successful when stars haven't mattered as much, they do still make a difference. And when oh, you yeah. get yourself into the ball game of, even if some of these guys, you know, like you you see enough of this, and, and we have all seen guys that you go, uh, that guy's not a four-star, what are they thinking here? But – at the end of the day, you get a little notoriety bump with it, and more four stars will come. And you're like, oh, this guy's a four star, and he went there. I mean, think about for Chris Kleiman, kind of how things have unfolded with the success they've been able to have, like after they got Jake Rubley, and like he was a yeah. ESPN four star, and that kind of sets the stage. Yeah, like you you bring in the opportunity then for those guys, and the likelihood of those guys failing is lesser than your your three stars or the guys that don't get a rating just because like there's obviously something that people see that puts them in a class above even if it doesn't make sense to a lot of people so i think there is some merit to it and like at, at the end of the day again it's just all about like this props case stayed up more and that's a good thing i also throw out too that these rankings do change a lot and one guy that we're going to talk about is Ding near a, a five star in the on three rankings that hasn't been rated by the other three sites yet. So these rankings will change. They're very fluid, especially at this stage. And kind of like what DY and I talked about yesterday, there, there's going to be a top 100 player right now that probably doesn't have a profile yet in, in the 2024 or in the 2025 class, because that, that's just how it works. People are still getting discovered. The rankings, especially in this 2025 class, 
haven't all been like they're still discovering the guys in the 2025 class because so much attention has to go to the previous class and now especially with the transfer portal that we're really starting to get like the first batch of 2025 rankings where it's based on their junior tape and not some of their sophomore tape. Yeah. So if you, if you look at it and we can dive into to specific guys here now, uh, last week you went and you, you compiled your, your updated big board for the class of 25 for K state. If you want to go and take a full look at that, head over to kstateonline.com. Uh, but on that list, I mean, it was an extensive list. So if, if you read that, people, you're you're really in the know of what's going on. But now with the rankings that came out yesterday, eight of the guys that were on there are four stars or, bat, or better in the on three rankings that came out on Monday. And we know about some of the big guys at top. Obviously, Lincoln Cure is is in that top spot because, hey, he, he is one of the best players in the state of Kansas. And it seems like K-State has been on the verge of getting him for a long time now. But there are some other guys that fit in there. So we'll, we'll get into all of these guys that K-State's in on and, and has a legitimate chance to get that got these bumps. But uh, first and foremost, give us a little insight on the Lincoln Cure situation. Uh, so everything still sounds good with Lincoln Cure at the moment. Uh, he has a visit to K-State scheduled for the spring. And we're going to get into this in another video. He already has uh, a, an official visit scheduled to K-State in the month of June. And it's all about the early, they believe that there will be an early signing period in June. And Cure also has visits, I believe it's to Texas A&M and Oregon in the spring. I'm checking right now. Uh, where you think that he's going to visit those two schools. I believe that Oregon is probably a bigger threat than Texas A&M. He has, he has visits to Texas A&M, Oregon, and, and KU. And I believe that Oregon is probably the biggest threat of those other schools. And they're, they're the only ones that I think could challenge K-State. That doesn't mean that I think that this recruitment is going in a bad direction or that K-State isn't going to land him because I still think that he's going to be uh, committed to K-State at some point in the future. I just think that Oregon is like the main challenger. So he already has an official visit to K-State, already has a spring visit lined up to, at K-State. I, I would be shocked at this point if he isn't a K-State Wildcat. So it's funny you bring up Oregon and tight ends because there's another tight end that's a, a four-star in the state of Kansas that has ties to Oregon, and there's you know some hints there. Desan Brame from Derby is also in that mix. So if, if Oregon is kind of in contention for both of these guys – does it stand a reason that even if things flip around and like, you know, Lincoln Cure seems to be like the tight end that would be the, the most likely to end up at K-State right now where things sit based off of everything we know. But is there a scenario here that if Oregon is maybe the highest competitor for both of those guys that one way or the other K-State's going to land one of these guys? I think it's possible. I, I wouldn't rule out still that K-State could land both of them because Oregon is in on so many other top-rated tight ends that it, it's possible where somebody like Nate Roberts from Oklahoma commits to Oregon and kind of leaves Braham without a dance partner or Kira without a dance partner, with, and they both end up at K-State. Like, K-State will likely take two tight ends this year if it's Desan Bram and Lincoln Cure. So th th there's a chance. And with Bram, at one point it looked like Oregon was going to be the runaway leader and land him, honestly, even early. But K-State and Oklahoma have really kind of pushed back on that, and they're both squarely in the mix with Oregon. I, I still would lean uh, by picking him to Oregon if his recruitment ended today. but. The longer that it plays out, there there's a chance that K-State could land both Cure and Bram. All right, well, let's let's shift away from those guys and then dive into who the top player in the state of Kansas is. And uh, yesterday, uh, he ended up getting his ranking from on three, 15th in the country uh, in the on three rankings. That's the highest he is. But his overall industry ranking, he uh, bumps up to a five-star in the number 19 recruit in the country. Uh, number three out in the tackle, and that is uh, Andrew Babalola from uh, Blue Valley Northwest, who obviously there's some serious suitors for him because he's got the size. He's got a lot of things that teams are looking for in an offensive lineman, 
uh, and that includes some of the, the powerhouses in the SEC. Uh, what what does it mean for him to be getting the bump to where you know he's a, an industry ranking five star? And uh, where does K State kind of sit with this right now? It, it's legitimately wild how fast Andrew Avalola shot up in the rankings because he was a guy last year that at this time didn't have an offer yet. So to see his progression has been really fun because he was a guy that I heard about in about April of, okay, this is a guy that you need to watch out for. Like he could really blow up. And then seeing him at the K-State offensive and defensive line camp, I, I said that sometimes you just look at players and you're like, okay, that's a guy that's probably going to go to the NFL. Like you can just tell by how they look and how they move. And he was one of those guys. As far as his recruitment goes, he has a bunch of spring visits lined up, as as honestly he should, because he has offers from everyone. Uh, Auburn, Missouri, Michigan are some schools that he's planning on visiting. He's planning on visiting Texas A&M as well, and then USC and Stanford. And then he's also planning another another trip to K-State, where K-State is the, the school that he's visited the most. And it's actually the school that, that has been recruiting him the longest. K-State was only like his fifth or sixth offer, but K-State has been recruiting him the longest. And I think that you're kind of seeing that play out in a good way for K-State because it's kept them in it for Andrew Babalola. And, and I will say that I, I'm not as confident as the on three article states that he will take an official visit to Oklahoma that last weekend of June. I, I think that there's a chance that he visits K-State instead. Okay, so that'll be an interesting one to follow then. Uh, another offensive lineman that sh popped up yesterday, and this was big time because none of the other recruiting sites have even ranked him yet, but Broderick Scholl, who, I mean, you said in the in the big board, and again, go get more information there, a little more in-depth, but you said, you know, this is a recruitment that's flown under the radar. Uh, that's a no-duh statement to me because – Yesterday at two o'clock in the afternoon, I didn't know who this kid was, and then I show up in Bramlage Coliseum, and I'm like, "Yeah, you get him, get him in town, cats. What's what's going on here?" But he's inside the top twenty now, a four star offensive lineman, another one that K State's really heavily involved in. So, uh, what what does the significance of this mean? Because this is a little bit different than the other guys. The guys we've already talked about here, yes. they are all consensus four stars at least. We've known about them for months now. This is a, a big bump out of nowhere. Yeah, so what, what this means is that this is the classic recruitment that I just, or the classic profile that I talked about before, where they're going to be top 50, top 100, top 20 guys that don't have a profile or their profile, their profile hadn't been updated in a while, and then all of a sudden you look up and they're ranked really high. Uh, Andrew Scholl originally was from Missouri, then moved to Bixby, Oklahoma. Uh, his uncle, uh, I believe, is Andrew Scholl that played at K-State. Uh, he just has eight offers right now on the Power 4 level. So I, I, I think that his recruitment will really start to take off in the spring is kind of where, where we're trending. But uh, he has visits to Texas Tech, K-State, Illinois, and Nebraska all in the spring. And where K-State stands right now, they're in a really good spot. He has a good relationship with Connor Riley. Uh, Matt Wells has deep ties in Oklahoma as well as Brian LaPac. So this is a recruitment that has flown under the radar, but it's because Roderick Scholl likes it that way. He's he's a guy that doesn't really like the spotlight, doesn't really like uh, all the attention. So you you see this and you're like, holy cow, like where did this come from? But he he's a typical Connor Riley offensive lineman. He is he can move his feet well. He's nasty. Like you, you see. A little bit of everything from Scholl, and it it would be an insane haul of offensive linemen with how these on three rankings lined up. Yeah, it's it's one of those where I this is not only a testament to kind of where K State sits status wise, but this goes back to proving probably what people already knew. I mean, th this is a team that took in a tiny three star running back named Deuce Vaughn and a two-star defensive end in Felix Anya DK and turned them into what they became, two of the best players in the Big 12 and Cows for Big 12 champions. This is this just showcases the talent finding and the scouting ability of this K-State staff 
to yes. being on these guys as early as they were. And, you know, this is also a reminder, too, and I'll throw this out there, like, don't always be disappointed when you do see that, you know, two or three star guy like there might there's probably a reason why K-State's dialed in on them. And, and we see this here where, you know, Broderick Scholl wasn't in any rankings until yesterday. But like you're saying, K-State, they they're in on this. They want this. Yeah, it, it's really a testament to I, I think on three specifically and the other sites have started to realize that, OK, when K-State offers somebody like we really need to pay attention. And, and I think that you see that even with other schools. I mean, there, there, there was a, a funny story about how K-State wanted to offer Lincoln Cure when they did. And obviously, like they're they're glad that they did. But there there was talk about, OK, do do we wait? Because they knew that if if they offered, that was going to really open the floodgates. Mm -hmm. So you see K State offer, and then you see a bunch of other offers fly in afterwards, and I, and I think that that's really a testament to how well that the staff has even thought of nationally, of their scouting and their ability to identify talent, and, and you're seeing that in in, in these rankings because if if K State were to land a lot of these players right now, this would be. And we said this in the 2024 class and the 2023 class, this would be probably the best class K State has ever had, rankings wise. Yeah, K State kind of just keeps building off of the success, so uh, that's that's notable as well. Uh, let's let's dive into one one more offensive lineman here for everybody. But Brock Heath is a guy that was also on your big board for K State, and he had he had been rated elsewhere, but yesterday he got his first set of four stars from on three. So uh, what, what's the look with Brock Heath? Uh, teammate of Andrew Babalola. So if you're playing Blue Valley Northwest next year, good you're luck. You're probably not touching the quarterback. Yeah, I, I, I hope that you have good defensive ends because you're, you're probably not getting to the QB. Uh, Brock Heath, uh, K-State Legacy, his dad played basketball and I believe it was the 80s. Uh, so he has kind of seen K-State and knows about K-State a lot, has visited K-State the most. Uh, he actually, and uh, this is just how far back his recruitment goes, uh, he would have been at the K-State offensive and defensive line camp last year, but was injured and didn't get to go to the camp. So he probably would have gotten an offer in June. But K-State, and especially Connor Riley, likes to offer guys in person. So he didn't get that offer then. So then he got it uh, when he visited during the fall. Um, it, it's probably K-State versus Iowa for Brock Heath at the moment. I know that he has offers from some of the other local schools, but Iowa is in a school that's kind of turned his head with K-State. And it's kind of like Lucas Allgaier, where if K-State doesn't land him, he he's probably going to Iowa instead. And you... Oh, and another thing about Brock Heath, too, is that K-State really wanted one of his uh, brothers that ended up going to Columbia. So, I mean, you, you see that K-State has had a lot of uh, familiarity with his family. So you think that K-State could use that to get over the top. And K-State's right there. I mean, it's another four-star offensive lineman. And then yeah. Connor, Connor Riley keeps bringing in and stacking really good classes. And we're starting to see that even now grow even more. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about, and we talk about getting in on guys early, but like that's that's what Gus Hawkins was last yeah. year, where he's the first commit of the class and you, you're – you know, kind of like, okay, yeah, this seems like a fine get. And then it's all said and done. He's the 70th rated player uh, in the class of 24 on on three. So that's significant. And I guess we'll we'll see kind of where that ends up going for, for K-State. And it's funny you bring up Iowa because it does seem like more and more it's K-State and Iowa coming up. And I think, you know, K-State a little bit more offensively uh, talented than uh, what Iowa th throws on the field. But it is there are a lot of similarities with what they do and how they want to become successful and that's kind of what these teams have to do like k-state and iowa are not going to get the four and five star you know running backs and receivers constantly you're going to have to do it some other way so go in there and say we're going to be the best with tight ends and offensive linemen and all this and kind of win in those margins and set it up elsewhere and that's kind of why i think these two teams are, are so competitive with each, with each other right now in the recruiting space. People aren't going to like when I say this, but K-State, KU, Iowa, Iowa State, all very similar. The, the, the coaches want to win the same way. Yeah. 
the coaches have all had the same success the same way. And, and really, up until a couple of years ago, you could say that all four were very stable in where their jobs were head coaching wise. Now with Brian Ferentz, you probably have to worry about uh, retirement. But the other three jobs, like you, you think that for the most part, they're they're very stable. Yeah, I mean those other guys. I don't think you're you're anticipating any movement from them anytime soon. Uh, Campbell might be the only one, and that might be because at some point Iowa State fans have to kind of get tired of six and seven win seasons every year. I would think, uh, but we'll see. So that's kind of the book on what sets up for K State recruiting right now. Uh, anybody else that we need to know about in the rankings yesterday, or uh, any other notes? Because Dylan Duff, uh, pretty high end three star. What what does that mean moving forward? Uh, you, you can read my mind. I was about to say, uh, with Dylan Duff being an 88, uh, I posted this yesterday, uh, and I, I don't know if people really saw it or, or really cared, to be honest, but, but but Blake Barnett was an 86 at this time last year and ended up getting to the 89 range. So Duff can play his way up into the four-star category, and he's somebody that, like we talked about in the commitment video, where I said if he has a good senior season and does uh, stuff on a circuit, during the spring that he could get up to four star status easily because he has all the tools just like Blake Barnett did. So it's good for Duff to be this high because it, there's a lot more like of a possibility to get up to four star status. Like Blake Barnett was great during his senior season and, and what ended up being just short of four star status on three. So you have a little bit more wiggle room to get up to be in that 90 range and if if duff gets a bump even i mean that'd be three quarterbacks in a row or four quarterbacks in a row that have four star status on at least one recruiting service yeah that's uh that's pretty significant and pretty good get there so it'd be interesting to follow along throughout the entirety of the season obviously we're like 10 months away from the like the the last set of rankings kind of coming out but it is good to see now and obviously it paints the picture that K-State isn't slowing down and they're still finding ways to be in the mix and ultimately be successful with some of these bigger end recruits even as the Big 10 and SEC try and detach themselves more from you know the Big 12 and the ACC it is K-State's finding a way and they're still going to be able to make their pitch and get legit talent into Manhattan that can help them win and ultimately hope that you are in that 12 team playoff and give your, yourself an opportunity to make some noise and see what happens when you get there. Uh, I'll add on to that too and say that uh, it, it is easier. I think right now to recruit with the big 12, because you can say, okay, all we have to do is win the big 12 and we're getting an AQ spot. You go to a big 10 or sec school. Yes, you can win the conference, but it's a lot tougher. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt about that. All right, well, that will do it for Drew Galloway and I. I'm Mason Voth. We will have more K-State recruiting coverage for you tomorrow because with all this 2025 news, there's a whole other element to this that needs to be talked about, and that's the possibility that there will be a signing period in June, which makes those official visits this summer all the more important, makes some of the dates that have been already on the schedule by K-State recruits all that more important. So we'll dive into that and a couple of other things revolving around K-State football recruiting as uh, the Wildcats start to get really serious for 2025. And uh, we're exactly a week away from the start of spring football practice. So if you didn't see the spring storyline show yesterday with D.Y. and I, go back to the K-State Online YouTube and watch that. Get it checked out. Stay up to date on the Cats and head over to kstateonline.com as well so you can see that full big board from Drew and everything else going on with K-State recruiting and uh, the team news as well. So that'll do it for us. We're out of here. Thanks for watching K-State Online.